Thanks for tuning into this episode of FinTech Focus TV, powered by Harrington Star, the global leaders in financial technology recruitment. Head over to the Harrington Star website where you'll be able to find all the latest jobs in financial technology across the globe. You'll also be able to download the latest issue of the Financial Technologist magazine, including the Top 1% Workplace Awards. Finally, if you're looking to grow your team, please get in touch. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to our episode of FinTech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I am absolutely delighted to introduce to you Igor Yelnik from Alpha Dense Capital. Igor, how are you? I'm pretty good. Hello, Toby. Nice speaking Lovely to you. Lovely to have you on the show. Absolutely. Likewise. We've been talking a little bit beforehand and, I, and I'm really looking forward to this show because I think, it's a, I think it's a really interesting space. It's a really interesting time. And I think you and what you're doing is at the start of a very, you know, a, a very interesting journey at the same time as well. So we've got lots to go into. The world of systematic macro isn't something we've covered massively on the show over the last couple of years. So I'm, I'm excited to dive into that. I've said to you beforehand that this has been my MBO, MBA journey as I'm learning from, a, from everyone I'm speaking to. And there's a, I've got no, no doubt that this is going to be one where I'm going to be uh, taking a load of notes and doing some fun things with this afterwards and, and diving into a whole load of research about what you're doing and where you're going with it all. So I've heard great things. I'm excited about this episode. Igor, before we get involved, please can you tell me a little bit about yourself and the business. I've been working in investments for the last 30 odd years, and out of them for the last 20, 20 years, I've been doing systematic macro. And in 2003, when I started in this area, it was not uh, even called systematic macro yet. And since, since then, I worked at two very interesting companies where uh, I managed several billion dollars. And after leaving the second one of them, I started my own firm called Alphidence Capital, which is a firm where we run our systematic macro strategy for our clients. And uh, you, we mentioned beforehand that it's an interesting space, the sort of, the, the sort of hedge fund space as, as a whole. You gave me a number beforehand, which I don't know if it was plucked out out, out the air, but it sounds <laughs> about right. There's like, there's like 10,000 funds in the space at the moment, which is phenomenal globally, isn't it, in, in terms of where that's gone. And I think it's been quite an interesting area because this has been for, yeah, for, in my mind, for many years, sort of, you know, I'm looking for a better term than enterprise, but it's been a big player marketplace. And I think technology uh, and certain you know, ev evolutions in that over the last couple of years has really created an environment there where it's much more democratized and there's much more you know, the, the ability to compete from whichever size you are as a, as a fund. So I'm really interested to get your take on the marketplace. I'm interested to see what's happening in hedge funds today and and your view of what I think has been a a sort of sleeping giant technologically. And I think the last couple of years have seen some real, uh, some real innovation in the space. Yes, absolutely. So uh, the hedge fund space uh, has been developing very rapidly uh, in the recent years. And uh, I don't know the exact number of hedge funds, but uh, I'm not going to hold you to it. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you very much. But 10,000 as the order of magnitude is probably about right. Hedge funds are, of course, differing in size and there are very large funds managing tens of billions of dollars. And there are much smaller funds which are managing like tens of millions of dollars. And uh, the difference between the two sort of extremes of the spectrum is quite significant. And one of the biggest challenges has always been, but especially in the recent years, has been to raise enough capital to, to make the business sustainable. And unfortunately, many funds died before they reach the break-even level in their businesses. Sometimes it's not even driven by performance. Sometimes people have very interesting strategies which produce uh, pretty good uh, investment results. But nevertheless, this is not enough for investors, especially if we're speaking about large institutional investors. They require more. And uh, when we speak about established funds, I think that the recent year's trend has been uh, more favorable to so-called uh, multi-strategy funds, mm. which are funds who hire traders or teams of traders, give them capital to trade, and hope that these traders or teams perform. And if they don't perform, usually they have pretty tight 
stop losses and then those people go. And this has been a, a tremendously successful model in the recent years. And these funds have attracted like tens of billions of dollars in investors' capital. And the returns have been very, very good just in that. Mm. So this is quite an interesting approach. And practically, when one thinks about how this works, you can think about a multi-strategy fund as a, a trend-following strategy where your asset is your portfolio managers. Basically, uh, the, the whole idea behind trend following is that you buy what goes up and you sell what goes down, roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. And here the idea is the same. When your manager is performing, uh, you uh, keep that manager, uh, you give them capital, you give them even perhaps more capital. Uh, once they stop performing, you basically sell this position. And this model, as I said, has been working tremendously well. Uh, portfolio construction and risk management is very important in such funds. And the biggest of them uh, have been doing a tremendous job managing, managing their portfolios. What I'm doing is a completely different model, uh, a completely different business model, because we're on uh, a boutique fund where we focus on uh, one strategy and we uh, concentrate all our efforts and all our knowledge uh, in uh, the strategy and we try to develop it further to make it better and we're quite patient we can survive uh, drawdowns even significant drawdowns this means that we are digging deeper and the idea here is that we want to deliver returns, which will diversify the returns of our clients' portfolios. So we never think about ourselves as the only investment in our clients' portfolios. We assume that there are others, and we want to diversify other investments so that the risk-adjusted returns for our clients should be better. It's, and it, it, it's a really interesting sort of take there, isn't it? And I think, you know, I think I've read and seen beforehand you talking about the... Uh, the sort of opportunity to trade macro differently to disrupt the macro uh, ar arena and that's you know from someone who, who as you said who's been in you know larger institutions in the past and seen you know seen that sort of play talk to me about the last three and a half years and what, what sort of prompted that decision because I, I love the sort of i love the the founder's mindset i love the the sort of you know quite often you see the 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 dissatisfaction with the status quo and the opportunity and the inkling of seeing something different Talk to me a little bit about your journey and what gave you the, you know, gave you the sense, as you said, to do something differently. What drove that decision making? It's been an evolution. If you, I started, I, I graduated with a degree in computer science, and that was in the in Saint Petersburg in the former Soviet Union. It wasn't an independent Russia even, and I I did work for about five years as a computer programmer, as a team leader of a group of computer programmers, and at the same time I was doing my PhD thesis in the area of queuing theory, which is an area of the probability theory. And then at some point I realized that I remain probably the last person in the former Soviet Union, which was interested in this queuing theory because the Soviet Union was about to collapse. And life changed dramatically and <laughs> I quit. And soon we started a company which became one of top asset management brokerage merger and acquisition companies in St. Petersburg and at all. In, in Russia, most of the money is concentrated in Moscow, but we were like quite good on the sort of country level as well. And it was a very interesting business where I learned a lot. I learned about how the market works. I learned about the, uh, you know, difficulty working in an environment where the laws can be enforced from some, you know, some of the laws can be backdated and you will learn that yesterday you were working under a completely different set of rules that, that you thought about but it was quite exciting and uh, a lot of things to learn uh, things were developing very fast and they, they developed into a crisis of 1998 when russia defaulted on its government debt and devalued its currency at the same time which was a, a ridiculously stupid thing to do because you don't devalue and default on your domestic government debt at the same time like you just print more money this is what all countries do and nevertheless uh, it led to a, a, to a drought 
uh, in the Russian security market. And uh, I just stopped working there. It was impossible. And um, uh, then uh, I spent some time in Israel and there uh, I managed a company which can be called CTA. Uh, basically, we ran uh, a relatively short uh, term uh, trend following strategies. And then I got invited uh, to join IPM, Informed Portfolio Management, which was a startup company based in Stockholm. And uh, there the idea was that we would build it into uh, a large institutional asset manager. So the inspiration was great. And uh, the strategy, which were, were about two years, was a mixture of quant and uh, uh, and fundamental. So at that time, the world was divided between systematic strategies and fundamental strategies. So if you are a fundamental manager, then basically you, you analyze what is going on and you make your, your call on a discretionary basis. When you are a systematic manager, you, you run a computer program and this computer program tells you what to buy and what to sell and how much. And the approach we used was to marry those two things and use fundamental macroeconomic data uh, as an input to our systematic strategy. And uh, this was uh, a very successful uh, company. Uh, we, uh, uh, as I said before, had several billion dollars under management by the time of mm. my departure in 2012. And uh, uh, I left, I built a new strategy from scratch with a team of computer programmers who decided to keep working with me. And with this strategy, I joined uh, a company in London. By that time, it was uh, a pretty successful prop shop. They had built a good infrastructure, which uh, allowed them to think that they would be able to, to support uh, a systematic hedge fund. So on that platform, we built, we built uh, a fund, which was managing also several billion dollars at peak. And the strategy evolved over time, it became better. And uh, upon leaving that one, I was able to use the same strategy, the same software. W with that strategy and that software, I was able to, to start my own company, Autodesk Capital. It's, a, it's an incredible story, isn't it? To take it all the way from St. Petersburg for today. And did you see that as you know, when you started out with Capital? Was that always on the horizon for you or was it something? No. What made you say that this is, the, you know, this is something which is going to be my journey. And what's the plan for you? I felt quite happy uh, where I was before, but things turned out in such a way that, you know, in which they did turn out. And uh, when I happened to be outside of that company, there was, there, there wasn't much thinking about what to do because uh, this is the thing which I love. This is the mm. thing which I know how to do. And this was the most natural way for me to, to proceed. It's not like I was sitting there and thinking about how to start my own business. Uh, it, it wasn't even mm. an idea. Mm. And, and t tell me a little bit about what it looks like now. So it's just under four years as far as I, as far as I can tell. Yeah, we started trading just under three years ago. The company was incorporated in May 2020. In, okay. in November 2020, we, we started trading. It was quite interesting, by the way, to incorporate the company when the whole world was locked down. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> I spoke to, I, I mean, I mentioned to you before, didn't I, when we started off this show in earnest, it was speaking to people who were suddenly yeah, launching and starting, the amount of startups we've spoken to who st started during the pandemic, who, who are the ones who started because of the pandemic, who started you know, before the pandemic and then, then suddenly felt right, we've got a different way of doing things here. What a journey that must have been for you, right? Yeah, that was also quite interesting. Yeah, and right <laughs> now we are we're, we're running we're running a fund and we, we try to do try to produce the best possible returns for our clients. That's always a that's always a good strategy, isn't it? <laughs> Honestly, yeah, so. if, if it works, the, the oh, reason, yes. <laughs> very true. And it's clearly something you're very passionate about. It's clearly something which you enjoy. It's your love. And you're seeing this business now grow, grow alongside it, which must be a really, it must be a great thing to be, you know, to be involved in. We were talking beforehand about the sort of badging you know, on FinTech Focus TV at the moment. And I think when people hear hedge funds and they're not necessarily thinking uh, FinTech, you know, in, in the space of it. But for me, as I said beforehand, I've worked for 23 years around financial technology. And yeah, going back to what you said before about uh, being in it before it was called systematic macro. 
I've been in fintech since before it became a cool thing to be called fin fintech. But there's so many different areas of what you talk talk about. My background is very much in the capital market space, and we and we and, and I've always been fascinated with the behind the technology that drives the markets. But uh, you know, beforehand, you mentioned it, it off air with me before about how you see fintech within this space, and at the very core of it, it is. You know, developing technology that, that allows it to be successful. So give me your view of the of the fintech world and, and how you fit into it. It's working in the financial market, so it's fin, and it's not tech. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, man every, off, a man after my own heart. <laughs> yep. Uh, so everything we do ends up being coded in the software and we don't double guess our system whatever the system does we do so all our input into the system happens at the stage of creating the software and since the software operates in the financial markets you can consider this to be a fintech although typ people typically don't think about systematic hedge funds as a fintech company mm -hmm. but yeah. eventually we create a software product and we exploit this uh, software product when managing money for our clients. So this is the nature of this business if we look at it from this perspective. Mm. And we uh, we have an R&D team which is pretty skilled in uh, what they're doing. Uh, we all have uh, pretty decent uh, coding skills and the uh, software which we have developed over all these years is a very impressive uh, piece of software. We're not in the business of selling software, but if we were, uh, this would have been like a very successful commercial product. There's a lot of fun, as, as you see, with Alan Howard, who, who suddenly decided to spin off into tech businesses further down the line. So you never know where, where, you, where you'll go with that as well. I want to focus on the tech and talk very humbly there about the sort of uh, pretty good developers that you've got and pretty good coding skills that you've got in the business. Talk to me about technology. What's, you know, we've seen so much development and so many cool things happening in the world of machine learning and everything else in between the opportunities within you know, AI as a, as a whole across all sorts of areas of, of business are very interesting at the moment. And there's been, you know, over the, the sort of 20, 30 years that you've been in the space, you'll have seen a massive technology evolution in terms yes. of uh, how, what and where we can use technology. So at the moment in the, the, you know, the world you're in and hedge fund worlds that you're in, what's exciting you about technology? What's, you know, where do you see the opportunity and what, you know, what can we expect and should we be looking at, you know, at in 2024 and beyond? You're absolutely right. The investment business has been transformed by technology massively. I still remember trading pits and open outcry, which is the thing of the past, except for maybe one exchange, which I can think about. And I always thought it was quite fun though, as well. <laughs> I miss, I miss watching it a little bit, but this is, this is definitely cooler, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't like too many people gathering in one space, <laughs> one little space, especially. So the progress in computer hardware over the last 50 years, so probably more than 50 years. Um, has allowed to create more complex software, which was unimaginable before. And the speed of information processing has increased so much that it allows to do things which were unthinkable, not only 50, but also 30 or 20 years ago. And the development of, let's say, GPUs has been another, another step in this direction. So now when you can parallelize your computations, you can solve very complex computational tasks. And the whole boom about AI systems, it, it is based on that because, you know, speaking about chat GPTs of the world, these are the systems which are built on complex neural networks, like on transformer architectures and the, with like tens of billions of uh, parameters to be estimated. And uh, this was impossible, uh, let's say 20 years ago. Mm. So the mathematics for it was already there, but the computing mm. power was not. Mm. And uh, we're seeing uh, a significant growth in various architectures of machine learning slash AI tools. And this area is going to continue its development and things we have seen so far is just the tip of the iceberg. And what, what was very interesting for me is the application of those tools in investments. So how can you use them to forecast 
uh, asset returns, how can you use them to build investment portfolios? Mm -hmm. And most of the applications which people use happen in higher frequencies than the frequencies we are interested in. Because mm -hmm. our strategy has always been pretty slow. It was probably one of the slowest hedge fund strategies in the world, uh, which uh, allows us to trade with uh, high capacity. So our capacity is not really limited. We can manage significant amounts of money. Uh, and I was very much interested in how the machine learning tools can be used on lower frequencies. And mm -hmm. the problem here is that when you have a high frequency of trading, you naturally have more data. And when you want to estimate a model with a large number of parameters, you need to have more input data. So the question is, what can you do when you don't have too much data, mm. which happens in low frequencies? Mm. And this is a fascinating task. And we have, we have accomplished some results on this path. And again, I hope that they will benefit our clients. This is what we're trying to do. And so, so when you're looking at those sort of issues and sort of yeah, problems that are, are seen, seen there, uh, this is a really naive question, but it's just, I'm, I'm interested in it. Where, where do you start with that? How does, how does that, you know, you're looking and recognizing a problem. Um, and as you say, look, data, data, I think is one of the most fascinating areas of financial services, full stop. It's a, it's a conversation that everyone's having. And I think it's probably one of the biggest growth opportunities within the industry. I think there are other areas of, of industry that have embraced data a lot more and, uh, and have done better things with it. But I think if I look at a kingmaker of what's uh, allowing you know, funds or banks or you know, both on the buy side and sell side to perform at pace and you know, create that trading advantage and increase efficiencies and productivity, data's at the core of it. Yeah, I think there's still a, a, you know, a, a sort of reluctance to really sort of form you know, compelling strategies. And I think companies like you who are getting that are, are dividending returns, but I'm really interested about where it starts and, and how you, I mean, it, it feels to me like you've got a very sort of interested, fascinating team that sort of pulls on strings and then sort of builds out uh, things from it. But I imagine it's more structured than that at the same sort of time. I'm really interested just to, to, to hear the psyche of how you sort of, you know, where you start with the problems you're talking about there. To begin with, we have to make a very clear distinction between problems which are solved by AI in the more traditional areas, like in banks, for example, or in image recognition or in machine translating. There you have problems with very high signal to noise ratio. If you are trying to, you know, to separate cats from dogs, you know, Cats are exactly the same as they were a thousand years ago, and well, they will probably be the same a thousand years away from now. <laughs> and the dogs are exactly the same. So, uh, well, and, they've, and, been, and, uh, they've been bred into new, new, new crosses and all that sort of thing, I suppose, haven't they? <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. But anyway, you get the point. And another thing <laughs> is that whether you're trying to tell a cat from a dog, neither of them cares about it. <laughs> Even if you have told the difference between them, the cat will remain the cat and the dog will remain the dog. Yeah. This, this is not what is happening in the financial markets. In the yeah. financial markets, the signal to noise ratio is very low. Yeah. The second thing is that when many smart people try to solve the same problem, they uh, arrive at results which arbitrage away the inefficiency they're trying to exploit. So just imagine that you have told yeah. a cat from a dog and it's no longer a cat or a dog. It's a mix of the two. So this is happening in the financial markets because if I know that this is an inefficiency, you know that this is an inefficiency and millions of other smart people know that this is an inefficiency, we are trying to exploit it and it may disappear. This is what has been happening and we have observed it all the time. So when we try to build something, we always start with an idea. We always look for an effect which is measurable, which is intuitively clear and which is not going to be arbitraged away quickly. We are mm. not interested in something which will survive for a year. Mm. Uh, and uh, when we find something which uh, meets all those criteria, we uh, formulate the idea, we typically discuss it between us. Uh, we 
formulated on paper, of course, with some formulae. And if the idea still makes sense after it has been put on paper, some ideas don't. <laughs> because, you know, formulating things on paper sometimes you can wash it that, out, can it? That, that, that does wonders <laughs> <laughs> to those ideas. <laughs> it eliminates them altogether. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so then we will rigorously test the idea and we will attack it from uh, all possible angles. And if it still remains a good idea, in our opinion, yeah. we will put it in production. I love the simplicity of it. It's so often... Oh, yeah. it's so simple, <laughs> of course. Anyone can do it. <laughs> I would suggest that anyone could do it. May well be a little bit of a, a secret within that. But I think the beauty of it is and this is often what i think sometimes the yeah the the hardest things is doing the you know, doing simply you know, following simple structures and uh, and keeping the discipline of making that those sort of things happen isn't it but it, i i'm i think it's fascinating what you're doing and uh, i think the opportunities to you know to continue to evolve in it are, are, are incredible um and i'm really excited to hear what you guys are up to i mentioned it beforehand about innovation in the space and and uh, and technology around around the, the sort of buy side and hedge fund space in particular if you're to look at this and it's in a very crude sort of question but if you were to look at the the language or the technology which you think will have the biggest impact which people should be looking at you kind of alluded to this a little bit but you know beforehand already but if you were to say one area there which you think is the you know a potential game changer for you know tech within the space within the hedge fund space next year what would you say that would be this is a good question and i think that first of all i don't know the answer and i don't know the answer I, I don't know what, what the next big what the next big thing will be. I think we're going to see some transition from one digital quality. These complex AI models they are already used by funds, but mm -hmm. I think there is more on the on the way. I think in terms of of the architectures, I think we're going to see more uh, interesting architectures of neural nets. From the computational perspective, I think a real game changer will be if the quantum computer becomes a reality. And I have no idea whether it becomes a reality at all, but uh, if it does, this will be the real game changer. It will be the next, the next quantum step, a qu yeah. the next quantum level, if I may use this pun. Because, you know, what I started to think about when you asked me about it, I thought, okay, GPUs, already here uh yeah. the uh, uh, languages in which to uh, uh, code all these are already here all the systems are here so the hardware is here the software is here the knowledge is here so from this perspective you know these are not like major things we're yeah, going to yeah, see yeah. improvements and i think when more money becomes managed by uh by more sophisticated strategies i think we're going to see high efficiency of the mm -hmm. financial market and high efficiency of the market means uh, a lower cost of capital for mm -hmm. the real sector uh, because uh, this will mean uh, a more fair pricing of financial assets, uh, which is a good thing. I think that a hugely important thing which uh, should be happening is improvements in, in the market infrastructure and making some markets more efficient from the technology perspective. But, you know, like big step uh, forward will be when we have another jump in computational power. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with I'm pleased you said that because you know, the, when I think about this, there's, I'm, I'm a big believer that some, one of the big handbrakes to innovation within financial services is trust. And you know, trust in the technology's ability to be accurate, you know, particularly. And when I talk, talk to people a lot about, uh, you know, people who are outside probably the technical space, technology space, and they're more, you know, financial services people, so, you know, so to speak, which I think is becoming less of a blurred line, uh, you know, by the day. But you're talking about people there who, uh, you know, will almost scoff at AI due to it being approximately right, as opposed to, you know, as opposed to, you know, dead certain facts. And, and it allows them to sort of push things off, as I said earlier on today in another episode. It allows people to push things off in the same way that they did with cloud and how long it took cloud to fully adopt itself within the financial services space. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, look, I, I don't think we've seen a fraction of the potential that we've seen in a lot of the technology at the moment. As you say, as, continue, as, as you know, computational power continues to evolve, I think we're in for a really interesting world. So I know it's a difficult mm -hmm. question, particularly with no prep to push, push your way, and I'm pleased that you are. Uh, mm -hmm. 
gave, gave it some let's say gave it some thought there but it's yeah. a really I, I think it's a really interesting time for technology full stop in this space and it's going to be yeah. it's going to be yeah, fascinating to see where it develops yeah absolutely and you know when i told you about the market infrastructure we have we still have some remnants of the remote path where let's say you have settlement on t plus one or even t plus two mm. right just think about it you can make like thousand trades a minute many people mm. do mm. and they're settled t plus two yeah t, t plus one is the sort of on the agenda of so many people i'm speaking to at the, at the moment and the uh, yeah the issues that that's going to create and the opportunities look i think it's yeah it, it's two ways of looking at it isn't it and i, and I know some brilliant companies who really invested time and, and effort into this over the course of the year with brilliant minds thinking about it. You know, maybe creating this hybrid cat dog to some extent, <laughs> what, what, we're talking, <laughs> what we're talking about. But it's, yeah, there's some great minds thinking in this space at the moment uh, on some really complex problems that create massive opportunity. And that's why I'm so passionate about it. And, and clearly you are as well. Look, it's been fast. I, I told you this would disappear very quickly as a, as a, as a half hour and, it's, and we've gone above and beyond already on it. And I feel like we could be talking for a long time and it's just scratched the surface. So hopefully we can have you back on the show again at some stage to uh, uh, continue to check on the progress of the business, but to have your thoughts and, and go into it and dive into it in a bit more detail. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, having you on. Tell us, uh, how can people get in touch with you um, and who should be reaching out to you at the moment? I'm on LinkedIn. And if somebody is interested in speaking with me, it's very easy to, uh, to find Igor Yelnik on LinkedIn. There are not too many Igor Yeldicks. <laughs> well, we'll have you tagged into this as well. And uh, I think it'll be well worth the conversation for anyone who wants to find out a little bit more about what you're doing over at Alphabet's Capital. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure and honor having you on the show. It's been a wonderful, the, I think I said to you beforehand, the variety of conversation I have is a genuine pleasure on the show. And it's, and it's been great to talk to you and hear, hear your views and hear what you've been doing and take the story of from St. Petersburg to today and everything in between. I'm, I'm, I've really enjoyed the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure being on your show and uh, I hope that we can speak in the future again. We definitely will. And thank you all for watching. We will see you very soon on another episode of Fintech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.